College of New York. Susanna Cavalla is the uh, is a professor of, of, of uh, modern languages, and she's also the dean of the John C. J. Um, Rome Center. Uh, she's the academic dean there, and she's um, a dear friend of many of ours. Uh, we also have Christina Lombardi Diep, who is a visiting assistant professor of Italian uh, here at Loyola University. Also, Wiley, a former also former chair of the modern languages like Susanna. Um, and Samuele Pardini, who is uh, uh, at Elon University in North Carolina, uh, who comes to us uh, today. And you were from exactly, where were you, you had a conversation today? Where were you from Italy? Uh, Tuscany. Tuscany. So they, they're all going to uh, speak of different aspects uh, of uh, some of the things, already some of the people maybe we've heard in, in previous lectures or previous uh, talks. Um, and uh, we'll get started with uh, Fred then. Uh, no, I'm just going to sit here and uh, for, some reason, for some reason I left my uh, written uh, text somewhere else. So I'm going to uh, see if I have it on my computer and if I don't, which I don't seem to have on this computer, I'm just going to talk to you about what I My goal today is to explain to you why you don't know about the writers that we saw earlier and what happened to the earlier writers of Catholicism, of uh, Italian-American Catholicism. There was an article written by John Paul Russo, edited in a volume of Malus uh, by Dr. Mary Jo Bona, who gave a beautiful address yesterday, in which he talks about Italian-American writers and, and why the Catholicism uh, doesn't uh, make it in American society. We talked about a little bit earlier about Flannery O'Connor wanting to drop the Mary. Well, she wanted to drop the Mary out of her name, not because she had this sign of self-conscious, but because it was this other consciousness of uh, and, and this intellectual persecution of Catholicism in American culture. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say as it was as bad as the early persecution against Jews in intellectual culture. But Italian-American culture did not serve well. And this is the reason why you don't know that Pietro Di Donato, in 1939, wrote a, uh, published a book called Christ in Concrete, beat Grapes of Wrath out yeah. for Best uh, book, of, book of the Month Club, and uh, subsequently went on into... Uh, Ignomy, you know, nobody knows this book. Why? John Fonte, the same year, published uh, a book of short stories, Dago Red. He went on to be well known in Italy now, but unknown in America, not taught in schools, etc. Why is it Jerry Mangione, a couple of years later, right before World War II, writes a beautiful memoir called Montalegro. They wanted to turn it into a novel. Uh, he writes this beautiful book. It was, it was produced, it was supposed to be inside the package that went to every soldier who was shipped overseas during World War II. This was the beginning of World War II. Um, that didn't happen. Had it happened, I'm sure his, his whole career would have changed. But there's three major writers in American culture that didn't make it. Why? Not because they were Italian-American, I would argue, but it was because they're Catholic. And they weren't great Catholics. You know, they weren't holy rollers, as we used to call the, the, the real the diehard Catholics. But they were, their work was, was soaked, it was marinated in Catholicism in such a way that none of them could even extricate themselves when they wanted to be these cool, de detracted intellect de detached intellectuals. And so you find this, this incredible Catholicism. And that was something that the American intelligentsia could not tolerate. Uh, one of the reasons why these guys were also not accepted into the American intelligentsia is because they refused to kind of uh, blindly accept communism. In the 1930s, to be a commie was to be cool, believe it or not. And um, none of them, as, as uh, John Fonte said, I haven't sucked out, no, no, Dieter Nagel said, I haven't sucked out on communism. He became a communist the night that Sacco and Vanzetti uh, were executed, probably out of some kind of euphoric experience with other people. John Fonte 
went to speak to a writer's congress and immediately the people kind of pulled him out of there because he wasn't talking the party line. And Jerry Mangione certainly never fell for the party line, even though he was left-leaning. And so these people had these strikes against them. And what we find then <coughs> in the writing of Anne Calcagno, of Tony Ardizzone, and the written paper that this comes from will be published, I guess. We'll, we'll work on it. But in, each, in this paper, I talk about each of the writers that we had here today. And I'm going to kind of recreate it from my own memory. Uh, just for a few minutes. In the work of Anne Calcagno, Pray for Yourself, I mean, Anne is not the Holy Roller writer uh, that's going to replace Mother Cabrini's biography as the model uh, by which all young women become Catholic. Uh, but her work will make you think of your own Catholicism. The same way that Tony Ardizzoni's work will make you feel your own Catholicism, whether it's in his short story called Holy Cards, uh, or uh, the story that, it's, it's interesting, next week, or two weeks, I'm going to Italy to teach at the University of Cosenza. These very writers who are in this room translated into Italian. No, Accavate, no. Accavate. yeah. Because this is where Giuseppe's going to be. And, and so, I have to go to Italy to teach them in Italian, and they wrote in English. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. But what happens then when this experience transcends uh, uh, the, the, the kind of little confines of our little conferences here is that people begin to see this connection between Italian Catholicism and American Catholicism. And the difference is exactly what Anne was saying, that the idea of looking at the Madonna and child. I mean, Italian-Americans, did, we, we didn't luck out. We lucked out coming into America at a time when America needed a lot of workers. So we all got jobs, we all made money, and by 1960, Italian-Americans were above average in income. But it wasn't until 2000 that we became above average in education, and the average education in the United States is a high school diploma. That's it. So what does that say? It says that, we built our presence on the shoulders of money, not on the shoulders of intellect. The intellect of Italian-American culture is, going, is being developed and will go on. And it, it's done through this literature. A couple of other things. We came to the United States at a time when the United States was moving from an oral tradition to a literate tradition. We still have a tendency to maintain our culture through the oral tradition which is nice, family stories and so on. But people don't understand that literature begins when or orality is translated into writing. Homer, who's Homer? Homer wrote the literature. Who was Homer? Nobody knows who Homer was. Homerus in Greek means the people. The guy wrote his name Homer on there, and, and we, we don't really know much about Homer. But he was the guy who translated the oral stories that he heard. The same way that Tina DeRosa is the woman who translated the stories of Taylor Street. Tony Artizzoni, the stories of Little Sicily, and, and you know these are these people are taking their stories and they're translating them into literature, and it's a strike against us because of this translation of the oral tradition. So what happens when the critics read their work? They say, "Well, we've already seen this. We've already seen this with the Jews. We've already seen this with the Irish writers. Uh, you know, when, when Pietro di Donato came out." Uh, After Christ in Concrete was another story, uh, Three Circles of Light. Uh, you know, we've already seen this. We don't need this stuff anymore. And each culture needs to build that. And until the 1980s, Italian-American, you know, I was on my way to, to writing about Walt Whitman. To me, I got involved with Italian-American literature because I'm studying African-American, <coughs> Jewish-American, and they're, they're making me take these courses, and I'm saying, you know, where's the bros? Where's the Italians? <laughs> you know, I'm in Spike Lee's film. He goes, where's the bros here? You know, where's the Italians in this room? And they said, there are no. You know, and what happens is, we, we never understood enough to be able to figure out how to counter that by asking our libraries to buy the books. You know, every time I, I, I'm met by an Italian-American, uh, where can I get your books? You know, and if I have one with me, I'll probably give it to them. But in a bookstore, 
You know, go to the bookstore and buy the book. Go to the, the library. Oh, oh, my library doesn't have your books. Tell the library to order. Where do you think the money comes from? Taxpayers' money to buy this book. So this anti-Catholic movement in the United States, but it's not just that. It's the literary critics who are interpreting a certain form of Catholicism, so when they see the Catholicism that appears in the Italian-American, which is a Marianist Catholicism, where, where, where the Madonna is focused, and where does this come from? This happens when Christianity imposes itself on the culture that's in Italy, which was a matriarchal-based culture, and they say, hey, you know that woman you're marrying? She's the son of this guy. He's our God. Oh, I mean, she's the mother of this guy. Oh, okay, bring him along. You know, we still worship the mother, and, you know, mothers, babies are so cute and wonderful. The mothers have the power. Puzo knew that mothers had the power when he wrote The Fortunate Pilgrim. The Fortunate Pilgrim was a literary success in terms of critics. Financially, he lost it. So what happened? What did Puzo do? He did the right American artistic thing to do. He eliminated the mother. No, actually, he turned the mother into a father and he made her the godfather. I was on my way to write an article about uh, Don Corleone being Lucia Santa in drag. <laughs> and then Puzo confessed to Camille Paglia that indeed Don Corleone was based on his mother. <laughs> now interesting, all gangster rap in black culture comes out of two movies, Scarface and The Godfather. What if those macho guys who ran gangster rap realize that the gangster that they're imitating is a woman in drag. <laughs> and th th these are the unknown things. So, and so Italian, there's these strikes against you, anti-Catholicism, anti, you know, this, this kind of um, xenophobia, this fear of women and the power. Italian Americans have not been accepted quite often because of this focus on women in their books. You know, and I'm not saying the men, are, but there's a, one, probably one of the best feminist books I've ever read is Mario Di Capri's Maria. You know, it's, it's a, Raymond Di Capri, right? Is it Raymond or Mike? Mike, Mike, who's that? Mike Di Capri. Um, and so there's this, America doesn't quite know what to do with this stuff. So that's why it kind of sits. And the critics, because it's not something that they learn in their school, in their institutionalization, they're not going to go there. And, and when I go to Italy to teach, they, Italy doesn't understand Italian American culture at all. Uh, and they, they see us as, as kind of pagans in terms of culture. Uh, we have this different form of Catholicism. I always tell Italians, you want to understand your past, come to the United States. I tell Italian Americans, you want to understand your future, go to Italy. I'll leave it.
and I pointed out to Anthony that I knew that was a racist slur because my father loved boxing. He was a former Golden Gloves champ, and I used to watch the fights with him all the time, and George Chavalo was the heavyweight champion at a certain point. So I knew by that they were saying, you know, I was really black. So that's one thing, but let's fast forward to Loyola University Chicago. I remember being at a Women's Studies Committee and suggesting that we devote one of our seminars where we read important thinkers to Italian feminism. And I swear to God, one of my colleagues, I'll call her a colleague for want of a better term, I'll tell you later what I really think she was. She said, Italian feminism, <laughs> isn't that an oxymoron? I also remember being at the Modern Language Association Women's Caucus. The subject on the table was mothers. I listened for uh, 45 minutes of how their mothers had destroyed their lives. And it's funny, Joyce Wexler, one of my dearest friends, of the chair, uh, person of the English department, said she never forgot it. Because I stood up and I said, everything I am, everything I know, everything I do is due to my mother. Without my mother, I would have been a total flop in life. She is my role model. And they all turned on and looked at me. <laughs> so, you know, loving your mother, being a practicing Catholic, and being Italian-American mm -hmm. in that very strange world of the Ivy League in the 60s, mm -hmm. those were painful experiences, but they made me who I am. I'm going to talk about Tina DeRosa um, in response again to what we talked about before. The best thing that we can do is teach these writers. Read them, treat them critically uh, with great seriousness, and teach them. My paper is called A Beauty in the Eyes of God. Those are Tina De Rosa's own words. A Beauty in the Eyes of God, Tina De Rosa's Edenic novel, Paper Fish. The first epigraph is by the writer herself. On any level, Italianita is religious. The second one is by another Italian-American woman writer, Carol Mazzo. Love of the world is really my main love. This table, this piece of bread, this ham, this afternoon light. Mm -hmm. The sound of your voice. Like so many Italian-American women writers, Tina De Rosa is far from a household name. Nonetheless, since the 1980 publication of her singular novel, Paper Fish, her writing has been praised and written about by some of Italian studies' most well-known writers and gifted critics. Jerry Mangione, Fred Garnafe, Helen Barolini, Mary Jo Bona, and Mary Frances Dupuisa, to name just a few. <laughs> when at Garnafe's behalf, the novel was reprinted by the feminist press in 2003, it carried the original rhapsodic preface by Sandra Mortola Gilbert, and a no less celebratory afterward by Elvige Junta. Yet another demonstration of its literary significance. Critics lauded its modernist form, its lyrical style, and De Rosa's daring manipulation of time and space, unusual in a genre characterized in the main by straightforward chronological narration and social realism. They also concurred in seeing in Paper Fish an elegy for lost times and places whether Grandma Doria's land lost across the sea, Italy, or Carbolina's Berrywood Street, De Rosa's evocative name for the little Italy of her childhood. Most of the critics marveled at her ability to create two complete universes, each with its own cosmology, topography, mythology, and heterogeneous cast of characters. Two universes that converged in ambivalent fashion in Carmolina's imagination, beckoning yet ominous, light-filled yet suffused with shadows, pulsating with life and already evincing the, delay, the decay that would relegate both to extinction. Italy was, quote, the land that was hidden on the other side of the world with blue waters that were always still, end quote. But at night, the moon was a blue hole in the sky, washing the world blue-black, making the trees black as ash or as death, end quote. De Rosa paints Berrywood Street in chiaroscuro tones as well. First, luminosity. Like a peach, the sun rises over the street. The street
street is called Berrywood. <coughs> then a kind of dark desperation. Here were no white picket fences, no small houses separated by gardens, but rows of buildings three stories high, bricked and set up against each other. There was no light in the buildings, in the rooms it seemed always gray. What draws this writer over and over, this reader over and over again to paper fish, however, is neither its experimental nature, its original expropriation of the form of the elegy, its fairy tale or fantastical cast of characters, and even less, its retelling of the immigrant experience in the process of acculturation, both of which entailed untold losses, especially for the Italian American female. These topics, though provocative, have already been treated at length by some of the great critics mentioned above. Rather, it is Paperfish's poetry that I wish to explore, for only poetry can embody the sense of the sacred that is at the root of Tina de Rosa's miraculous novel. Paperfish begins with an epigraph that poses one of the central questions of human existence, the problem of identity. Our images and our memories face each other bewildered in a mirror. Who is to solve the mystery? Who can read these words without thinking of St. Paul? For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. The problem of identity is inseparable from our questions concerning reality. If I do not know who I am, how can I know what is real? Even more reminiscent of scripture are the first words of the prelude. This is my mother. I just have to show you this. I've got all of my terrible scratching, so just ignore those. Here's the prelude. The epigraph is up here. Now look at the large print prelude. This is my mother. First, the words are reproduced in exceptionally large, bold-faced print set apart from the rest of the sentence. Second, along with the epigraph, they comprise the entire first page of the novel. And third, by their elliptical form, they implicitly pose another question. For Junta, and I quote, the opening words of the first section, This is My Mother, stand almost as a subtitle, suggesting that the writing that follows is itself the mother, the locus of creativity that brings past through memory back to life. An intriguing interpretation, however, I would offer a more radical one. Like the epigraph, with its veiled reference to St. Paul, these words cannot help but bring to mind the most solemn words of the Mass. Not surprising. For the short prelude, a term in itself rich in meaning, for it evokes simultaneously the condition of music, evanescent and beyond language, and a feeling of imminent revelation. These words will dramatize the night of Carmelina's conception. Thus, the prelude, like the words of the consecration, is a celebration of spirit made flesh. Sarah's mother cleans, cooks, and engenders a child in an act of love that is described edenically. This is my mother washing strawberries. These are my mother's hands. Skin that has touched thousands of things now touches strawberries. And strawberries are the first thing she has ever touched. My mother's skin bruises strawberries. Her skin will bruise my father's. That night their skin will make me but I know none of this. Rarely, if ever, have I heard a more exquisite description of lovemaking, especially marital lovemaking. <laughs> Perhaps one of the reasons that such reverence is accorded the body is the central consciousness that informs the narrative, that of the child Carmelina with her perpetually astonished and watchful eye. Carmelina has no fixed age, nor identity, nor ontological consistency in the novel. She is simultaneously an idea in the mind of the creator. I exist with the God of decisions, and he is deciding me. Preconception, free birth. She is simultaneously that, a fetus 
growing in her mother's womb, a newly emergent infant, and the artist as a young girl, whose age ranges from infancy to young adulthood at the novel's close. To complicate matters further, although the tone is similar, there are two voices that merge seamlessly in the text, that of the child and that of an unidentified omniscient narrator who hovers over the family, observing with tenderness its most private moments. If the first person narrator that begins the novel telescopes her entire life in one continuous flow from preconception to the death of her father 21 years later, the third person narrator who fills in the blanks is also Carmonina, but a Carmonina distant in time, place, and experience. <coughs> the dramatic elements of the story derive from this tension. Like most children, Carmonina either misunderstands or understands very little of the adult world that surrounds her. It is only through Grandma Doria who imparts to the child the knowledge of a world even stranger than her own, who speaks on a daily basis with her dead husband, Pasquale. How many of our grandmothers spoke to their dead husbands? Mine did on every day. I need a refrigerator before I go to Pope Brothers. I've got to talk to Tony. <laughs>
So this is going to be an article, and I just want to summarize the poetic techniques, and then I'll go right to the conclusion. I won't give any examples. These are the poetic techniques, and those of you who are our, our scholars of poetry will notice these are all classic mm -hmm. modernist techniques. We see them in Eliot, we see them in Amy Lowell, and, and uh, Octavio Pop, and, and, and writers all over the world, modernist writers. Okay, repetitions. Repetitions that frequently become incantatory. The cultivation of grammatical and visual condensations, such as sentences without verbs, short staccato phrases, or synesthesias that communicate in a few words an intense emotional state. The use of Christological imagery to summon the divine. The deployment of color and anthropomorphism to create a spectral universe and a secular structure that replicates a life cycle infused with religious significance. So I'll skip just to the end now. So those are the examples that I'm going to be looking at. And one that I didn't mention is a kind of a cubistic mm. technique. And those of you who are uh, students of Latin American literature, if you know the book El Señor Presidente, it's, it's cubistic. The knight is a giant eye that looks down, for instance, she does this. Ultimately, however, paper fish is not for me, even though it is for many critics a story of loss, but of hope. For one thing, Tina de Rosa's gift of poetry has preserved for time immemorial the radiant images of her family and community. But not only poetic skill ensured paper fish's privileged place in the canon, but also the ability of De Rosa to communicate the deep spirituality that infuses even the most ordinary actions of her characters. For the Mexican poet Octavio Paz, there are only three means of overcoming our temporal limitations, only three means of dwelling, if only for an instant, in a realm beyond time and space. These are the erotic experience, the mystical embrace, and the poetic act. If they differ, it is only in the object for whom our actions are destined. In the erotic experience, it is the union with the loved one. In the religious experience, it is the union of the purified soul with God. In the poetic experience, it is the reintegration of man with his deeper self. There is no doubt that Tina de Rosa's luminous novel, Paper Fish, partakes in all three of these experiences. Hence its permanence, hence its universality. Love is seen as something that defies the laws of physics. Religious belief shares with love the lover's ability to fuse with the other. It endures all the indignities, as St. Paul tells us, and it is clearly the saving grace of the beleaguered Taylor Street community mm -hmm. and paper fish. Finally, Tina de Rosa has the ability to make us see in the commonplace the miraculous, to recognize in the most anodyne of acts the workings of the spirit, and to create a novelistic world so fresh, so original, so new as to place the reader for an instant in ilo tempore, in the time of the beginnings. Thank you.